Sustainability is without doubt the key challenge of our time. It's vital for a strong and growing economy, vibrant communities and a healthy environment. In Victoria, it's our goal to build the sustainable state because it's the only way we can be sure that we will continue to thrive into the future and that we won't be shortchanging future generations. The state's sustainability framework sets out three key directions that we need to integrate into the way we live and work. Increasing resource efficiency, protecting and restoring our natural assets and minimising our daily environmental impacts. This is where the ecological footprint tool is so useful. It helps us to evaluate the impact and demands we place on our natural environment. If we don't understand this to start with, it makes it very difficult to fix. The ecological footprint tool clearly identifies opportunities for each of us to reduce our environmental impacts and improve our resource use efficiency. We have been the most successful species on this planet. 200 years ago, nobody could have imagined the kind of lives we're living today, the cities we've been able to construct, the technologies we've been able to create. And so we are asking ourselves, how will we be able to maintain the success in the future? Since the end of World War II, we have more than doubled in population and we are consuming far more per capita. Like in the last century alone, we are now consuming tenfold the energy of what we did just 100 years ago. And we are recognizing that the planet is getting awfully small. If we just compare, you know, how successful we have become as a species, we as a species, together with our cows and pigs, we are about 97% of the biomass of all vertebrate species, while only about 3% are wild species. So we have been able to dominate the whole ecosystem of the planet. Now, that may be a success, but its success also has its cost, that the planet is getting awfully small. So that's why we have developed the ecological footprint to start to measure how big are we compared to the biosphere? How can we actually use our ecological assets more effectively to live well on this planet? Now, the ecological footprint is a very simple tool. It's a tool like a bank statement that tells us, on the one hand, how many resources do we have that renew itself, thanks to the biosphere that is powered by the sun, and how many do we use? And then we can see to what extent, actually, we are dipping into the overall capital, or to what extent we are really living within the interest that nature provides us. If you want a real, simple and effective model of how the economy operates, just take a cow, because everything that enters the cow as food will leave again. Very similar to an economy, a cow also produces value added, the milk. The milk too, whether you consume it or not, becomes waste. So a farmer knows how much area, how much pasture, how much cropland, how big of a farm is necessary to maintain his or her cow herd. Now in the same way we can say how much area is necessary to support me or to support our cities, to support our economies, to support the world as a whole, all humanity, to maintain all the resources we consume and to absorb the waste. That's what the ecological footprint measures. But the amazing thing about nature is that it provides us resources and the resources we transform into waste eventually and nature then takes the waste again, powered by the sun, makes them back into resources. So this is kind of the cycle of life, you could say. Now, if we start to use resources more rapidly, and make them into waste, then nature can transform them back into resources. We start to have problems. It's like if I start to spend more money than I earn, you know, it works for some time, but has consequences. So if you have these balances, like in any other area of life, like how much money do I earn compared to how much money do I spend? Or how many assets do we have as compared to how many liabilities do we have? This calls for accounts where we can compare demand and supply, you know, income and expenditure. The same applies to nature. 
Now the supply side is particularly simple. If we just measure the amount of nature we have in terms of number of planets, it's basically just one, one planet that is available. To be more specific, we can say how big it is. The surface of the planet, roughly, is about 51 billion hectares. Now that's a lot of hectares. Each hectare would be enough for a soccer field. So we could have 51 billion soccer games going on at the same time if you paved over the whole planet. But not all of this area is biologically productive. 71% of it is ocean surface. The rest is land. Some of the land is covered by ice. So not all of the land is biologically productive. What I mean by biologically productive is area that really supports most of the biomass. And that's both on the land as well sea area, particularly close to the coasts. So if you look at how much of the area of the planet is productive, it's about a quarter of the whole surface. Now, what does that actually mean on a per person term? If you just divide this area of biologically productive space by number of, of people on this planet, today about 6.4 billion people, what we get is roughly 1.8 hectares of biologically productive space. That's basically what we could say the budget that nature provides on a per person basis worldwide. But that needs to support everything we do. All the food we eat, all the resources that we consume, absorb all the waste. We may choose not to use everything for ourselves because some may remember we're not the only species on this planet. The fish I eat is not available to the seal or to the whale. Or we compete for space with elephants or giraffes. Also even smaller animals like in the tropical rainforest as we start to intervene with these ecosystems, their biodiversity is under threat. So we could ask ourselves how much of the biologically productive area do we want to leave aside for other species so they can thrive? How much do we want to keep for ourselves? E.O. Wilson, for example, the father of the biodiversity idea, uh, in his latest book, The Future of Life, says, let's put 50% aside for other species. And he is very committed to great lives for everybody. So it's not to say people should have miserable lives. He just says one of our big assets is our biodiversity, our genetic diversity that we have inherited, that it took at least a billion years to establish. Now, in order to maintain it, possibly we want to leave a good chunk of our budget aside for other species. Now, let's assume we take E.O. Wilson's word. And it's up to you to choose because we can choose to live on a very depleted planet or we can choose to live on a more diverse, biologically richer and probably more stable planet. Uh, so it's up to you to choose. But let's assume we take E.O. Wilson's number of 50%. That would then reduce the budget to less than one hectare of ecologically productive space per person. That's what we have. So we can be even more specific about sustainability and say, how can we have fulfilling lives? All have great lives on average on a budget of about one hectare and possibly less if we choose to be a larger population, if we really will grow to nine billion people, that would mean that we would have about 30% less per capita capacity available. And so the challenge may get even more difficult. And so I would say universities, you know, government agencies, uh, libraries, please put a big sign on top of your door. How can we all live well? How can we all have great lives on less than one hectare per person? That's the big challenge we're facing. That's what the ecological footprint tries to figure out. Now that was the supply side. How much do we actually use? How much do we use for providing the things that we consume? Like in my life, I don't know about you, but I eat food. Food from some is from the sea, some from the land fiber to close myself. Uh, now some of it may be plastic, but some of it may actually be cotton or wool fibers, etc. So that uses space. Fibers for paper, quite a significant part of the overall footprint. How much air is necessary for timber for our furniture, for our housing, to house our infrastructure. Quite significant space too. Not very large on the maps perhaps, but very highly productive land where we build our cities. Uh, area to absorb our waste areas 
to actually absorb the waste from the fossil fuel burning, quite a significant part. Uh, how much bigger would the world need to be or how much more biosphere would we need to actually cope with the excess CO2? So these areas we can all add up, that's what we take from nature, that's what we call the ecological footprint. We believe actually an underestimate of what we use uh, because some areas some aspects of our resource consumptions are hard to quantify, data is scarce, so we probably don't have the full picture. Also, areas that we use for various functions, let's say there's a forest where we get timber as well as water supply from, or double cropping uh, in, in agriculture, we only count once, otherwise we would exaggerate the footprint. So we basically just look at a minimum number that we think we believe in order to maintain the resource flow. So when you look at the balance sheet, we see the supply is quite a bit less than what we actually use, the demand on nature. Now, how is it possible and how can we use more land and sea space that, that is actually available? But actually, it's quite easily possible to use more than what we have. Think of water. We can pump water out of the ground more rapidly than the ground waters are being recharged or we can fish more rapidly than fish is being restocked or we can cut forests more rapidly than they are regrowing. It is quite simple, like with money, quite simple to spend more uh, than what we earn also in terms of resources. And that's why we need accounts. That's why we need to find out what's the supply and what's the demand. Over the last 40 years, we've just had one planet. That's why the line of supply is very, very horizontal. It's true, it's not the same planet every year. So it's a different planet because we change ecosystem compositions. So we have less forests now, more grazing space. Technology changes, the way we transform resources into products. So it is a different planet every year, but every year we can make the balance and compare how much did we use as compared to what nature was able or the biosphere was able to regenerate in that year. So what we see is that today, we're using 20% more than what nature can regenerate. In other words, it would take a year and more than two months to regenerate everything that we use within one year. This difference is what we call the ecological deficit, the difference of how much more rapidly we are using resources like forests, fish stock, putting CO2 in the atmosphere than nature is able to accommodate. Now, there's nothing wrong with liquidating assets as long as we know that we're liquidating assets. But if we believe it's a true income and we live on this liquidation as if we could go on doing that, then we put ourselves in danger. It's like never looking at our bank statement. A simple way of showing this difference is looking at the world as a big bucket. The bucket that gets filled by solar energy that just provides the interests of nature, the natural interest that nature can regenerate. That would be called a kind of a sustainable use of the resources. What we do today is we use technology. And not all technology needs to be that way, but we seem to like the technology that allows us to access the capital stock, to kind of drain the resources more rapidly, getting a bigger flow. So at the time it's easier because resources flow more easily because we're depleting the overall assets. That's why we can actually live like high on the hog at the same time as we're depleting our ecological assets. If we look at this bank statement and say, oh, we're using more than what we have, is this good news or bad news, you know? And I would say, actually, it's good news in the sense that it gives us more information. And we still have choice. We can still just not open the bank statement and recycle the envelope, you know, or we can look at it. But if we do spend too much money, we also know what the consequences are. So there is a kind of a feedback loop. In the same way, we have to think of nature from a budgeting perspective and say, what are the consequences of overspending? Because we are able to overspend nature. Ecological limits are not like a wall where we just crash into them and say, oh, wow, we reached ecological limits. Now we have to change whatever. Actually, it's very easy to exceed ecological limits. It doesn't get harder to cut trees, actually our chainsaws will get more efficient. So as we cut more trees, it doesn't get more difficult. If we pump more CO2 in the atmosphere, it doesn't get more difficult. So they're not as direct feedback loops from nature telling us that we're using more than what is being regenerated. Or a piece of wood, sustainably harvested or not, you can't see the difference. 
you need accounts, you need assessments to find out to what extent the capital or the assets were used in a sustainable way. That's what the ecological footprint offers. How is this all calculated? It's actually very simple. You look at how many resources are being produced in this country, how many are being exported, how many do you get through imports, and then the net balance is what you actually consume within this country. And then we can compare this amount with how much air is actually necessary to regenerate these resources, which gives us the overall footprint. So it's a very simple balance calculation of import, export and production, looking at the yields, getting the areas necessary to support these flows. Now, in detail, obviously, it's a bit more complicated because we have about 3,000 data points per country, and so there's a lot of calculations going on, but in essence, that's done for every resource category. So we can do the bean counting, not just for the world as a whole, but for each individual person or even for a nation. What I just want to show you is a few examples of countries, to what extent they draw on resources and to what extent they have resources available. So for example, if you take United States, uh, roughly nine and a half hectares per person are being used for the average consumption. And comparatively, we can say, okay, there's only 1.8 hectares available per person worldwide. So what does that mean? It would mean roughly that if everybody lived the American lifestyle worldwide, it would take over five planets to maintain this resource consumption. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that actually my footprint is even larger to a large extent possibly about two-thirds of it, because I'm flying around the world telling people, how can we have smaller footprints? And you think, how absurd is that? You know, it is absurd. And, and I have to live up with that fact that even though I bicycle my son to daycare, you know, that doesn't really balance out all the air fuel that I'm using up, going around meeting people and saying, how can we actually live within the means of nature? So there's a contradiction there I have to live with. Uh, uh, but that's why I'm actually speaking to you now through this media. So. I don't have to fly to you, so we save a little bit of footprint right there. But then we can also compare the United States with other countries. For example, you know, many Americans love to go to Italy. You know, it's this great country. You know, you can walk around, you walk around, watch other people walk around, they watch you walk around, and everybody's having a good time using very few resources. They like to eat slowly, you know, and local food. There's a lot of public transportation available. Italy is able to provide a very high quality of life on three times less footprint. Now, that's an inspiration. Imagine if we applied American and Italian and Japanese and Kenyan ingenuity into how to build cities that actually work well for everybody, that can operate on a much smaller footprint. When I grew up, the best time I really had walking to kindergarten, walking to primary school, then bicycling to high school was really that time where I could basically move around on my own. And many young Americans are deprived from that possibility. Parents are forced to drive their children around. So one example where quality of life and resource consumption is not correlated at all. We just looked at 1991 to 2001 to see to what extent have footprints increased or decreased. And what we found, quite to our surprise, is that in high-income countries, the per capita footprint actually increased about 8%, while in middle and lower-income countries, the footprint per capita actually decreased. So what we see is that in areas where we think most likely we may be better off the world if we had smaller footprint in high-income countries, it has actually increased, and in areas where you may think mm, they may actually need larger footprints to meet basic needs, they actually have smaller footprints per capita. So that's quite a worrying trend. Footprint analysis can be used to look at countries in much more detail. For instance, compared to the number of Netherlands, for example, available to Holland of the last 40 years, which was one Netherlands, uh, you can see to what extent they have grown their ecological footprint as a whole nation from using about the equivalent of two Hollands to about six Hollands. Holland is one of the great examples of environmental planning where they have done an enormous effort in actually setting goals and achieving many of them. 
And overall, what we still see is that the ecological footprint is still growing. Slower than in other places, nevertheless, it's still growing. That shows us the challenges we are in. Now, the only goal is not to have a smaller and smaller footprint. I mean, it's just a necessary condition that we make sure humanity's footprint is smaller than what the planet can regenerate. But it won't be possible to achieve high quality environments without looking at the quantity of our demand on nature. And then we can see how does that compare to other nations. Let's say one of the Asian tigers, South Korea. They started from using about one South Korea in 1961 now to six. So they have grown about doubly as rapidly. The footprint allows us to have much richer information about nations. That's why it's interesting, not just people interested in sustainability, but also to financial analysts or to people who study countries, their geography, economic development, uh, to understand better what is happening, what kind of conflicts can emerge, to what extent countries may not be able to maintain their resource throughput. One of the main outlets of our national calculations for the ecological footprint, where we compare how much we use in each nation as compared to how much actually there is within each nation, is issued in the Living Planet Report by WWF. And so what they use the ecological footprint for is actually to show to what extent we are using ever more resources. Because if they only wanted to save tigers and they want to do more than that, they recognize it's not possible to save tigers without reducing human pressure. And it's not possible to reduce human pressure without doing it in fair ways, because otherwise we just produce more conflicts. So they use the footprint to show that increasing demand. And at the same time, they have another measure. We could call it a Dow Jones Index of Ecological Wealth. They call it the Living Planet Index to actually show to what extent population sizes of wild vertebrate species, both in the sea and in fresh water, but also on the land, have declined in size. So their average population is now 30% down compared to 30 years ago. We could interpret these two lines, ecological capacity or ecological health going down, our demand going up, we could say that's very similar to a funnel. That's what the natural step, for example, calls the funnel. The idea that it is possible to increase our demand on nature at the same time as ecological capacity is declining. So these are not two contradictory stories as some people hold up. Who is right? You know, those who say everything's getting better or those who say, oh no, everything is getting worse. Actually, we can accelerate the cars even though the gas tank is getting emptier and emptier. We can have bigger parties as we use up more and more of our capital. So that's what the funnel basically shows that yes, our demand is going up and our supply is going down. So the room to maneuver is getting smaller and sustainability really is about how can we open up this funnel again, you know, so that we have more space to maneuver, we have more opportunities, more possibility for choice. Because if not, we just start to bump more and more into the wall of the funnel. Like that's experienced by organizations, let's say through uh, regulatory fines or through uh, increased fees for waste disposal or uh, increased resource costs, consumer boycotts. The ecological footprint also shows what we call the bed cover effect. That like in a cold night, you know, when I cover our head and then we get cold feet because the cover is too small. The same with the biosphere that is slightly small compared to our appetites. Uh, and so how that plays out is like, for example, in California and we say, oh, let's save our redwood trees, you know, and then we just buy Indonesian timber. So it just puts the pressure somewhere else. In the end, we have to look at the benefits. The footprint is not just this moral burden of saying, oh, it's bad to have a smaller footprint. On the contrary, it really is a commitment to having the best lives, recognizing there's only so much budget. Like with your financial budget, how much financial budget do you have? And then how can you make the best choices to use your budget most wisely? One interesting example from Australia was actually the large retail developer, their environmental manager, calculated just roughly 
how much area is necessary to maintain one square meter of retail space and not for the products being sold, just for cooling it, heating it, rebuilding it every five years, washing it, whatever. All that added up makes a footprint about 1,600 times larger than the area itself. So it takes like 1,600 malls per mall, you know, of ecological area to support that area. Now that's a large number. What do you do with it? I wouldn't have known, I would have told the environmental manager just to burn the report, not to get fired. But actually what they did with it is they recognized this resource consumption is a huge cost to the developer. They rent out space in their malls to other retailers. So they can actually realize a lot of savings by having smaller equipment, by not heating and cooling as excessively. Actually now they're even planning a mall in Melbourne without AC equipment. So there are lots of possibilities to actually make architecture much more eco-friendly, which also is more comfortable to people generally, and uses less resources and costs less. So they have used the footprint to help communicate these ideas to the CEO, to shareholders, to renters, to get people on the same page and really make this happen. The mayor of London, a very interesting in sustainability. He wanted some more ammunition to say, how can I show the importance of sustainability for our city? And so he commissioned a new report. The new report found that actually it's more like 235 times larger, the footprint of London, than London itself. It looked at more details. The Business Council of London, London First, said, we have to look at this. This is serious. How can we help reduce the footprint of London? Because we want to stay competitive. We want to make sure London stays a prime center of the world. So they have calculated the footprint and looked with businesses and with developers that what are the options? How can we reduce the footprint while actually improving our quality of life? Now, that's just London. There have been over 150 cities, we believe, and we don't know them all. There may be more um, that have calculated their footprint. Some more like as a student project, others in a lot of debt. The United Nations Population Fund looking at the footprint um, as a way of explaining population pressures and there are many more examples from around the world in all kinds of languages. What we need as the next step to make the ecological footprint effective for governments and organizations and individuals is to standardize the way footprints are being calculated. And that's what we are doing with the Global Footprint Network. We're bringing together practitioners to find ways to standardize the applications to steadily advance the research behind footprint accounting and also to find ways to make the ecological footprint ever more relevant to government policies as well as businesses who are in need of increasing their environmental performance. The benefit of the footprint really comes from a number of points. One, it provides not just relative numbers of, oh, is this can a little bit more than this bottle, but actually in absolute terms, it shows to what extent our activities fit within global limits, to what extent we draw on the finite ecological capacity of this planet. A second benefit is that it communicates quite easily. People can experience size. So areas, how big is this space? How big would be necessary to support me? So it becomes much more easy to communicate. And I believe also it's quite comprehensive. So it actually includes so many of the resources we depend on that we get a good picture. That it's not a coincidence why all these resource pressures on forests, on biodiversity, on water, on air are happening at the same time, but that actually just the pressures are pushing in all different directions. Rather than telling you what you need to do, you know, don't, whatever, don't eat too much chocolate or whatever it may be, you know. It basically just says, look, there's overall budget. Let's get together. It invites people to the table. It invites people's creativity. And indeed, we need everybody's creative ideas to say, how can we actually live well within this budget? And some people may say, I like more chocolate. And other people say, I like more bicycles. Other people say, I like more spaghetti. I don't know. So it's up to us to choose how we want to use the budget best. We just know overall, there's one planet. How can we use it best? for our well-being. In Victoria, we are making progress. We've begun to cut our water consumption. 
and our recycling rates are among the best in the world. But the Echo Footprint tool tells us that we still have a long way to go. If everyone in the world lived like Victorians, we'd need an extra three planets to support us. We don't have an extra three planets, so we need to start reducing the demands we're placing on our environment today. The Victorian calculation demonstrates plenty of avenues that we can pursue to lighten our environmental impact. The opportunities are huge, and often they save us money and resources and create a more livable place to be. I'd encourage everyone, from community members to business, to find out what their ecological footprint is and do their bit to minimise their environmental impact and create a sustainable Victoria.